So I have an announcement to make here, Joe Bulig, and oh, uh, it is Rome research related. There it is. I was ready that time. I didn't even Were. know it was coming. <laughs> I have decided to add an additional perk to the Bookworm Premium Club membership, Ooh, which will be more fun. work for me and no work for you. I'm in. <laughs> I figured you might like this. That didn't take long. <laughs> so I have had a number of people reach out to me about some specific book notes via the club. I've had people wondering, like, what does this actually look like when it's finished? And I do have a post on my website about how I take book notes in MindNode. I've since done a presentation for Bigger Plate which talks about how I take the mind node stuff and then incorporate that into Rome research. Tempting. And I realized that without a whole lot of extra effort, I could create a separate but public Rome research graph from the bookworm books that we have read. Okay. So I am committing on air here. I don't have a deadline for this yet. It's a great way to do this. <laughs> it's it's totally uh, something I external would do. pressure, which causes me to take action, apparently. Uh, that should be part of my motivation code. I forget there you go. what all they were. But uh, I'm going to put pressure on myself to create this and make it available to the premium club members. I'm not even quite sure how that <laughs> works, but I'm going to do it. I'm basically right. going to take everything that I have inside of Rome Research for the books that we have read and uh, transfer that over to a public graph. There are a lot of holes in it currently. Uh, that's one of my projects that I wanted to work on over the next couple of weeks as I'm on sabbatical is to go back and incorporate all of the MindNode files that I have and build out those notes pages. And at that point, I just want to be able to share them. So there's a caveat here where it's not going to cover every book that we have covered for Bookworm, because if you remember at the beginning, I was not using Rome, I was using a different app to just take node? book notes. Uh, not even MindNode, there was an iOS app. I forget the name of it, it's since been discontinued and I lost a bunch of the notes that I had. Hmm. So I do want to go back and add those. My thought is that now that we're done with bowling alone, maybe I'll have some, <laughs> some margin for some gap books and it would be cool yep. to go back and reread some of those early books anyways. And so I want to start doing that, building out those MindNode files. And as I do, attaching those to the, the episodes, they'll probably be a little bit different than what we talk about in the episodes, but that's sure. okay. Eventually I just want to build out that whole library. And the vision for this is that if you're a Bookworm Club premium member, you will have access to this emailed to you or it'd be available in the premium club section, you know, the, the super secret URL for this thing. And then you can kind of navigate this wiki style in a web browser. Interesting. Well, that sounds exciting. And if I was a huge Rome person, I could see how this would be super helpful, but not being a Rome person, I'm not really sure what you're telling me I'm getting, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> It Basically, cool. <laughs> what you will have is all of the interconnected notes that I take from the books that we read. So in addition to the PDF file of the mind map itself, which you can edit, uh, that's the other thing with these public graphs is that you can set them up so that people can contribute to them. And my hope is that if people are going to use my notes as a starting point, they can just go to this graph and they can start adding some of their own insights and maybe we can all learn from reading these books together. I have no idea what this is actually going to turn into, but I think it could be something pretty cool. Sure. It sounds cool. Well, I'm game, of course, but I'm doing nothing other than promoting it sounds like. So, I'm game. All right. So, now that I've put myself on the hook for a bunch more work, let's talk about all the work we currently did reading Bowling Alone. It, yeah. Actually, before we get there, let's, let's do some of these follow-up action items because you've got a couple. I do, uh, one of which I can follow up on. The other one I can't so much, but one, okay, so this is coming from The Practice by Seth Godin. If I have to summarize that very quickly, it's essentially building a daily practice of creating in some form. I mean, it's a very loose definition behind what that means. My intention was to discover when this practice is going to happen for me day to day. 
and I have discovered in the process of attempting to do that that it's almost impossible for me to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's, it's partially because, and this is also why my second one is nailing down who my audience is and trying to define exactly who that is in words written on a page. I don't have it written on a page anywhere because I haven't nailed down the exact word verbiage behind it. So we need to postpone that one. Primarily because what ended up happening is I ended up hiring an IT assistant at the church. So all the time it would normally take me to do my normal week to week day job stuff got a lot bigger as far as how much time it took because I had to slow it all down to explain every single step and checklist things and it, it's taking me a lot longer to do stuff so great timing for bowling alone um and <laughs> so i'm behind on a lot of things and i've got today and tomorrow and then my christmas vacation begins so i am hustling at, to the gills here so Part of that has led me to not having regular time to create things. I've been able to do some of the live stuff that I have scheduled, so the streams and the Analog Joe webinars I've been able to do. But outside of that, I haven't been able to do much. Like, for example, I've got an article about uh, the OmniFocus auto parser and update review scripts. I've rewritten those for iOS, and I haven't been able to publish the article explaining how to install this stuff and how it works because time. So I haven't even done that. So I'm, what Joe is saying is he's behind. <laughs> so I, I don't have solid answers on either of these follow-up points. But I have been paying attention to faithbasedproductivity.com. Yeah. And I, I've been noting day by day is something being published. Yeah. Not, not yet. It's getting there, though. <laughs> I have <laughs> published eight things, I think. No, four things in the last eight days, Okay, which is pretty close to where I would like to be. Um, I thought you were going daily. I want to go daily Monday to Friday. So okay. five, five posts a week. Okay. And there's a couple of things that are in the works, uh, which is a result of a writing habit that has been established, but hasn't seen the light of day yet. All right. So, uh, I think this is totally doable and I also have yet to figure out how to frame this in terms of what promise I want to make to people going forward. Like you go to the site, you watch the sermon sketch note videos or whatever you download the file, the natural reaction, if you like the site is, oh, I'm going to sign up for the newsletter. Sure. I kind of don't even have a real place to sign up for my newsletter because I don't, I have a, a EPUB book that I created a while back, the guide to purposeful productivity or case for purposeful productivity, which I, I, I like that. I think it's really good, but I have no idea what I want to promise in terms of newsletters and things when they sign up, which I feel is a very important piece I need to nail down. Yeah. Yeah. I am thinking I want to publish the newsletter once a week on Mondays, kind of the you know, TGIM sort of a thing. Sure. And I just haven't done it yet. So uh, hopefully beginning of the, the year, the newsletter piece will be there and that will kind of be the glue that holds the rest of it in place. But sure. there is a bunch of stuff that is being worked on that you don't see. Uh, I am proud of the fact though, that like one of the pieces that came out of this is the last minute gift guide for nerds like me. <laughs> I saw this. This was well done. Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, just a collection of links that didn't take a ton of time to put together, but it was created solely because I was approaching my blog through the lens of, I need to find more regular stuff to post here. And so this is kind of evidence of like, if you ha if you make that a priority, then you don't have to worry about like running out of ideas, which I guess was kind of part of my hesitation in the past is like, well, I'll throw some stuff out there. It'll be good, but then there won't be anything to follow it up. Um, this kind of showed me that like there's low hanging fruit there in terms right. of filling in the holes around the the post promoting the podcast episodes. So makes sense. It does. So there so we I go. Hope, I hope you can continue it. I, I I have subscribed to the RSS feeder. I open Net Newswire daily, and I check 
faith-based productivity <laughs> to see if it has a post each day. I thought you were going seven out of seven is what I thought you were trying to do because you could schedule no. things for the weekend, but going five out of seven makes sense. I, If I were to post things the way I probably should, it would actually be closer to six out of seven for me, but I, I have zero expectations of actually pulling that off because that's a lot. Sure. It's a lot to ask. Yes. Yeah. So stay tuned. Fun stuff coming. Well, I'm, I'm tuned. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I need. I just need a bunch of other people who are like, hey, Mike, where is the post for today? You mean text you every day? I'll you text you on Friday and say, hey, where's want. the post? This Friday. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I may ignore it. May not. We'll see. <laughs> I've told a few folks, you're welcome to text and call me all you want on Thursday and Friday, but uh, I'll get back to you the following Monday. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's follow-up. Let's talk about this behemoth book before us, Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. This is maybe the biggest book we've read. I think this might be longer than Paid to Think. It definitely felt like the longest book we've read. <laughs> <laughs> uh it's about the the subtitle here is the collapse and revival of american community which i think is a fascinating topic and i think is very appropriate for where we find ourselves right now however i did not quite expect uh, the amount of history lessons we got in this book and i also know that there was a afterward where they talked about the the internet and basically what had happened in the 20 years roughly since they published this in the first place. And I wish that that would have been sprinkled in throughout. I do think there's some really cool ideas here worth unpacking. So I kind of broke this down into the different sections. There's how many pages is this? 460 something? Yeah, I think it was four. When I looked it up, it was like 440 something, I think. Okay. 460 is into the appendix. Afterward is like 440, yeah. And I saw you had paid to think out too, so which one is longer? You want to guess? Uh, based on the size of the paid to think book, it looks like maybe that one's a little bit longer. The So paid to think is 659 pages. Oh, geez. It's not even close. Wow. <laughs> Uh, this one, Bowling Alone, was based off of a ton of research and a ton of science, and links to all the studies and things are in the back. I didn't really look right. at any of those. I tons and tons of charts in here. I feel like this is a great example of somebody who really just took meticulous care to put together an exhaustive collection of everything they know on a topic. And I feel like the approach that they took, because it's not just Robert Putnam, he worked with other people in the different sections. They were very thorough. They were very detailed. And I really respect the amount of work that went into it. However, from a bookworm perspective, this is a long one. <laughs> and yes. kind of boring. <laughs> very much so. Um, I, I will be completely upfront, Frank, honest here there were sections of this i skimmed and it's been a very long time since i've done that on a bookworm book and i i had it finished we were supposed to record a few days ago and life stuff happened and we weren't able to get that done but the i i was ready for that time frame so it wasn't like we were extending this so that we had time to read it it was just a long long book and i skimmed it and was ready a couple days early and things and it's just it's a slog as i put on twitter <laughs> yeah it's it's one of these that you just have to just dedicate more time to i mean it it, it was quite a quite an endeavor i'll say that <laughs> this is the literary equivalent of eating your vegetables i feel where it's not something that you really enjoy going through. I feel like it's worthwhile if you are curious about a specific topic, like I am, and I think probably you are too. And I'm anxious to see the type of conversation that springs from having read this. <laughs> yes. 
I feel like that is going to influence my rating when we get to the end quite a bit. Okay. Because all I'm left with right now is the emotional exhaustion of having gone through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do feel this has the potential to be one of those books that you look back on and you reference quite a bit. Sure. I remember when we went through The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, and that one was a slog too. And I think back to that book over and over and over again, and the examples of like the Apple and Blackberry, that's not the specific one he talked about, but he was using a different example. And I'm like, oh, that's like Apple and Blackberry now. You know, I made that connection and that stuck with me. Right. I'm curious to see over time if that sort of thing happens from, from this book or if it's just a bunch of information that you collected. Yeah. And then you move on from it and you never think about it again. I think it has the potential for <laughs> either one of those paths. Yeah. I think it'll be interesting as we go through this as well to see, you know, there are a lot of examples and stories in this, but something I struggled with was that there was so much and it, it was so long and there was so much data heavy science in it that it, I, I think it's going to be difficult for me to recall a lot of things. Sure in this i don't know if some of that's because of the sections i skimmed and then therefore i'm not actually a good person to review this i don't know i didn't skim that much but it did happen a little bit so i think there are some areas where it's going to be a little weird here because there, again there's so much in this that it and because it's the way it's format and stuff i think the memory recall side of it is going to be difficult at least for me so just to put that forewarning out there. Sure. Well, let's talk about the way it's structured and we'll kind of break this down section by section. Uh, the first section is the introduction. The second one is trends in civic engagement and social capital. Section three is why, section four, so what? Section five, what is to be done? And then there's an afterword where they talk about the internet and social networks, which is very important since the original version of this was written in something like the year 2000. Yeah, it's 2000. So it's 20 years old, almost 21. Which it's easy to forget that, I think, as you're reading it. I wish, though, if they were going to go back and expand and revise the version, that they would just sprinkle the new findings in instead of collecting it at the end in a separate right. section right but they took the easy way out so did we by skimming certain pieces yeah <laughs> sounds like did you skim some uh, too or is it just me no i definitely skimmed a little bit but i think okay. it's okay with this book because they're basically applying like the scientific method in terms of in terms of uh their approach to the the topic and so you can if you were to take like a speed reading approach where you read like the first line of each paragraph and then just kind of skim the rest, I feel like you're still getting the gist of what they are, are saying. Yeah. You're going to miss a lot of the details. But to be honest, there's so many details in here after the first section when I was reading it word for word, I was, I was like, I need... I need a lifeline. Throw me a yes. Throw me the raft. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, need, I'm sinking. <laughs> give me more charts, please. <laughs> I can't can't keep it all straight in my head. So uh, that was my approach to this: is going back to like how to read a book, understanding the arguments that they're making, not understanding and being able to recall all of the details of the arguments that they are 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 making. Yeah. So let's break this down, and uh, we're just going to touch on a small sampling of the things that we consider to be important in the book. Definitely not exhaustive of everything that they talk about because it is an exhaustive approach to the whole idea of community, really. Uh, section one, introduction. A couple important things, I think, here. Number one is the definition of social capital. This is a term that they use over and over and over and over and over again. And basically, if I'm going to put this in my own words, it is the strength of your relationships in a form like capital. You think of resources, money that you have in order to buy something, you know, so it is the sum of the, if you were to quantify the quality of your relationships, that's basically what social capital is. And then what it gets you is a bunch of different benefits in a lot of different areas, which they talk about exhaustively throughout the rest of the book. Right. Is that a fair definition? Yeah, I think that's good because it it's really 
what is the interconnectedness of the people that are in your closest groups? How often do you meet? What are the effects of meeting with them? And because the, the tagline on this is the collapse and revival of American community. So we're talking about community and the social interconnectedness that we build. I think it's very ironic that we're covering this book right now. Yeah. <laughs> Given pandemic and quarantine and isolation stuff and the second wave of COVID coming through and tons of lockdowns and a lot of people ignoring said lockdowns. So there's a <laughs> lot of that going on. And I think it's, it, again, it's fascinating to go through this right now, partially because the arguments that are made is that community engagement are falling quickly. Like that's a lot of what they set us up for here. But again, he's talking about your point, the social capital and what is that interconnectedness? How do we go about building communities? What does he mean by that? The way I've, I've, I've had this book sitting in a couple places where people have asked me about it. Uh, generally, whenever I have our bookworm books, I, they always end up like sitting on my desk at work or people see me with them. And sometimes I'm like trying to like set things on top of them. Like, I don't really want to talk about this one. <laughs> like I, I do that sometimes. This one, I wasn't too concerned about it. And I just let it sit out. And I had folks ask me about it. And I would just reference, it's similar to Lions Club, Shriners, your bowling leagues. Like it's that type of community that it's referring to and how it's declining and what do we do about it? That's the way I would explain the book whenever people ask me about it. But yes, social capital. I went on a rant there. Not a rant. Ramble. I'm good at rambles. Save yeah, that's me. that's basically the idea. Uh, and then the other like overarching theme throughout all of this is that there were things that happened near the beginning of the 19th, no, 20th century, early 1900s which kind of caused us to start building social capital. It went up for a while, and then about the 50s and 60s after World War II, it started to decline. And this book is kind of trying to unpack why is that and what effect is it having? Right. The thing that kind of hooked me is that the afterward is specifically written as COVID-19 is starting to happen. Like they address that in there and they talk about how it's social capital that causes people to wear a mask. Well, that's not exactly what they say, but they, they did all the maps and they studied all the areas and like the states that are high in social capital, they're the ones that people wear the masks because that doesn't protect you so much and more protects other people. The community. And so, yeah, exactly. I thought that was interesting, uh, but that's very specifically COVID related. I use that as an example since you, you brought it up. Yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, very valid. that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that I was looking to to get from this. Uh, what I got was a lot more of like digging into all the history and all the tests that they were running and all the hypotheses that they were trying to prove and disprove. That got a little bit old, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but I do think right at the beginning here, there are some really powerful ideas. Understanding this whole social capital thing, I think, is really important. They talk about the two different aspects of social capital being private good and public good. So there is a large part of social capital is this belief in uh, generalized reciprocity, where I'll do something good for you without expecting anything specific back. The belief there is that someone will do something nice for you down the road. It's kind of like the golden rule sort of a thing. And it doesn't take a vivid imagination to see how that's kind of deteriorated Right. In the, the United States specifically, because this is looking at it in specifically uh, America. Uh, they also talk about like positive and negative versions of this social capital, uh, which we'll dig into a little bit later. But the other really powerful idea here at the beginning, this very first chapter, is this bridging versus bonding. And this, I really liked. I had heard about this in a gap book. Uh, where is it? It was the... Let's Get Together, I think, the community okay. building book that I had read, the orange one. Okay. They talk about this bridging versus bonding in there. And I feel like this is really important if you're thinking about community and what type of community you want to build. Uh, this is something that's really relevant for me, by the way, because I've been thinking about as we're getting close to the end of 2020, going into 2021, what are my words 
for next year. I don't do like the whole yearly theme because it changes too quickly, but I have these <laughs> words sure. and then I kind of develop themes around that based on like the personal retreat stuff that I do. Yeah. And one of the words is community. I want to do a better job of building communities around the things that I am involved in, the things that I am passionate about. That includes bookworm. And so that's kind of why I want to try this Rome public graph experiment because I, I see this as a way to build some of that community. Sure. Uh, the other things that I'm involved with too, I want to consider that's where the, the publishing daily to faith-based productivity comes in. Like I want to build that community and I want to do it in a way not just makes me feel good, pat me on the back, but how can I serve those people? And then also, as you're thinking about building community, what type of community are you building? Are you building a bridging community? Or are you building a bonding community? <laughs> Uh, and I think these aren't, they makes a point that this is not exclusive. You can have both of these, but bridging is inclusive. It's bringing everybody else along and bonding is exclusive. This is kind of like the echo chamber uh, where you have some firmly held beliefs by a small group of people and it's like us against the world. That's kind of the right. negative application of this, but that's the right. one that comes to mind based on where we're at right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, what do you think about this bridging versus bonding? And do you, how do you see this playing out in your life and the communities that you're involved with, not just bookworm, but I know like you're working at the church, stuff like that. So what did you get out of this specific yeah, section? Yeah, there's, there's a few different ways. Obviously in today's society, there's a ton of political applications. Like I could go down that route. Um, the, the difference between trying to bridge between the two political parties or bonding and existing we're very, very good at the bonding of the existing, <laughs> but trying to bridge gaps, we don't even really try. And something we've been trying to do at at our church is developing, I, I hate to say like classes and, and courses and stuff, but it's communication in some form, whether it's a between services class or something from a sermon or materials that are shared of how do you build empathy? I, we've talked about empathy before. I talk about it a lot with friends and such, but there's a lot of conversation around how do we try to, in a Christian circle, we talk about how do we share love and understanding and, and listen to people who don't agree with us. And th there's a lot of those conversations that need to happen, especially in today's world. I've mm -hmm. got a number of folks that I've had this conversation with that did not know that there are a lot of executive orders and stuff in our state of Minnesota, <laughs> restricting travel and mask mandates and stuff. I'm running across people recently that didn't realize there's a mask mandate on. It's been on for months now. <laughs> so, Boy. but they didn't know it because they got so tired of the negative side of news and such that they just stopped listening to any and all news. They don't care if it's positive or negative they're, or even you know rules-based. They're not paying attention to anything, so they have no idea what's going on. So I'm running into that sort of thing a lot, but that's, you know, our church is in a weird position of trying to stay open as much as they can, but also trying to lock down as much as they can to stop spreading things. So it's a mess. Anyway, COVID, I don't really want to spend too much longer on COVID here, but uh, <laughs> bridging versus bonding, like outside of normal, I shouldn't say outside of normal, outside of COVID scenarios, I think bridging between community groups is super important. We don't do enough of that. I think bonding within community groups, we're very good at to an extent, Yep. which contradicts a little bit of what he's saying in the book, which is where that afterward comes in, because in the 2000, you know, the year 2000 version of this book, without that afterward, there's a lot of things I would disagree with in respects to today, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things like political involvement is skyrocketing right now, I believe, the numbers I looked at, whereas in his explanation of it, it's going down. Now, I know I'm jumping ahead here a little bit with that, but there's a caveat with that. Because he yes. talks about the difference between being involved and actually doing something. <laughs> Correct. Yes. They're two different things. So I get that. But I, I do like this distinction. It, it's super helpful to understand, okay, this group, let's, let's get non-sensitive here. 
this group around fountain pens, is it a bridging group or a bonding group? Most cases, that's a bonding group. It's, it's not designed to connect keyboard enthusiasts with graphics card enthusiasts. Like, it's not trying to bridge sure. that gap. It's trying to just, I love fountain pens. Show me all your fountain pens. Which ones do you like? Which ones do you not like? Why? Like, it's trying to build relationships within that group. So I like the distinction of these terms for sure. Let me push back on that a little bit because okay. I think... I mean, I am a member of the Panatic Slack and friends with Brad Dowdy, Mike Hurley. So I have a certain perspective I'm coming at this from. But my experience with the fountain pen community is that I think it tends to be a little bit more bridging than it is bonding because bonding being exclusive, it's kind of like you can't be here unless you meet some pre-qualifications they talk about bonding as being good for getting by it's like the fraternities at a college or university sure. where you got to go through hell week then you're one of us and now your brothers will do anything for you but it's us against the world sort of sure. a thing and that he says bolsters our narrow selves that's your identity and it's the super glue so you do it when it comes to relationships those relationships do tend to be really really tight I'm not going to take a bullet for somebody I met on the pen addict slack. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> and I feel like the, so maybe there's different versions of this, but sure. that is a great example. I think of a community where like I can get connected with other people who are doing different things around this common interest. And it doesn't matter if I am a if I'm the executive editor at the suite setup, which focuses on apps and computers and stuff like that, like if it was a bonding group, they would be like, oh no, you don't belong here. <laughs> but there's room for me at the, the table because really the only important thing is, oh, you like pens? Cool. Well, let's, let's network. Let's share contacts. And that's an example of, of bridging, in my opinion, which he says is good for getting ahead. It helps you generate kind of a broader identity. And he calls that the WD-40 for communities which i think is important wd-40 that's like something that it's the grease it makes things able to move and to change easily so that in my in my own interpretation of these two terms i get bridging as like let's grow this thing and bonding as like let's keep everybody out except sure. the people who are already here and maybe that's not entirely fair but that's kind of the picture that I no i think that's I get. totally fair i mean i just depend on and I, I wrote a note down here i wonder if there are different levels of these i'm sure there are yeah in that like the way i was interpreting it to begin with was the difference between trying to interconnect the people who are already in the group yes you're going to have people entering that group but from a bonding stance, you're trying to build up the bonds of the people who are there and help other people learn more about it. And it's okay if people are coming in, but from a bridging stance in my mind, I was connecting two existing groups. Gotcha. Okay. Like that's the way I interpreted it, but the way you explained it makes more sense too. So I think it maybe just depends on which way you want to define those. And that's why I ask about the levels because, you know, the way you're defining bridging is a a more expanded version of bridging than what I had in my yeah. mind. And bonding is a tighter version than what I had in my head. Well, they they can be, organizations can have both. You know, it's not an either or. So maybe there's like a hybrid approach here because I think there are definitely examples that are one or the other. Sure. So the primary negative example that comes to mind for a bonding community is something like the KKK. You know, you most people are like no absolutely i do not want to be associated with that but for the people who are involved with it taking aside the moral judgment on what they stand for right. they are a very strong bonding community gangs are another strong bonding community you know where again it's us against the world and you'll do anything for your your brothers um I wish I had some better positive examples of that. You mentioned the church <laughs> stuff, which I think like that's yeah. maybe a great jumping off point to go into the next section because he does talk about that. So section two, trends in civic engagement and social capital. Um, he mentions here, 
political participation, civic participation, and religious participation is chapters two, three, and four. The religious participation one obviously is interesting to me. I am very involved in my church community. You are too. And there's a bunch of positive stuff that comes from being involved in a church community. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it from just a purely sociological perspective of like, what is the church doing to the social capital in the community, taking the, the personal belief system out of the picture? I mean, this is the place where people thrive when it comes to social capital. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating to me that if I need something, I know, like, for example, if I needed help moving, or, or here, here's a better example. We had water in our basement. This has been a year and a half ago now. We got water in our basement. I texted four numbers, and in 30 minutes, I had nine people here to help me move things. Yeah. Like that is what happens. Like that's that's the social capital that he's referring to, and and it shows that interconnectedness, because I've built those bonds with, in this case, other men, and it's a big deal. And and I know that the those particular men, we've been very particular with making sure that we're able to build those relationships. We've talked about the process of building relationships together. I also know that one of those guys was building a house here a couple years ago and it was not uncommon for him to hit the group text of you know 10 or so of us that he's like i'm sheetrocking my garage tonight anybody want to help i got time i'll be there wait <laughs> and then you know things come back and forth whenever you have those bonds built they're like for example the same guy has a trailer i love to borrow <laughs> and He's horrible with destroying his lights on his trailer. Always dings them, the wires go bad. He doesn't understand electrical with that stuff. I do, like that. I, for whatever reason, lights and electrical make sense to me. So whenever I borrow his trailer, I fix the lights and then I use it and then I take it back to him. <laughs> and he texted me here a few weeks ago. I was like, do you need to borrow my trailer? My lights are broken. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that stuff happens. Now, I say all of that, and I know that there are people who want something like that and don't feel like they can get that. Like, I, I want to be sensitive to that because I know I've been there. And this this process of building up groups of friends and people that you can count on, this social capital... In my mind, it's easy to do that with something like a church. But I say that knowing that my wife and I have been very particular with making sure that we are connected in a small group and that we are a part of groups with the same people for years on end. Like We've been particular about that since we moved to this area. There are people in our church who are not like that. So I'm not, I, I don't want people to think that our church is just amazing at this. It's not. You know, we, we struggle with getting those groups built. And I'm, I'm sure, I mean, every church deals with that. So finding that group and finding those people is, I don't think it's something that just happens. And I think that Robert Putnam would agree with us that that's not something that just magically occurs. You have to be very intentional with it. I just know that, like, to, to our point here, church is an easy way to, to start that, I feel like, because you have a common ground you're starting from. Yeah, he mentions that religious ideals are potentially powerful sources of commitment and motivation. And so you can leverage those and build social capital, build a thriving community. There are a couple trends that he talks about, which I don't think are really true of my church, but my church is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I use that in the best possible yeah. framing, but it is. And this kind of just solidified that in my mind. He mentions that a lot of people still believe, but they don't really belong. At my church, it is really hard to come and believe and not belong. You're going to get sucked in or you're yeah. going to decide this isn't the place for you. <laughs> right, right. You're either in or you know you're out. Yep, yep, exactly. And so the whole trend of religion being more privatized and having less parish or institutional involvement. And then also he mentions that... Um, where does it say? Americans are going to church less and the church is less engaged in wider community. 
not true of my church. My wife and I co-lead the, the outreach team at our church. And even with COVID, like that's a very, very important thing for our church. It's part of our church DNA. It's part of our church vision. You know, our pastors have really focused on that, which I think is a good thing. I think it's a healthy thing. Otherwise, like, what's the point? <laughs> you know, it's not to make you feel better about the time that you're investing every week. Right. Maybe for some people, that is why they, they go to church. I don't know. I can't really wrap my head around that. Uh, and I'm not trying to pass a judgment on that, but it's just not my experience. So I really can't comprehend having been a part of this church for the last, now I guess it's close to 15 years, why you would do it a different way or for different motivations. Uh, and again, I know that's based on just my personal experience. Um, but I thought this was obviously an encouraging chapter for me by he's talking about how regular church attenders talk to more people, regular worshipers are more likely to visit friends, entertain at home, attend club meetings, belong to groups, uh, and that religious activities go far beyond just conventional worship. They talk about how a large percentage of personal philanthropy is from church-based volunteering. Uh, and so the challenge is really just to keep your focus on other people as you're involved with this stuff, not make it all about you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wonder if churches reaching out holistically is still on the decline or if it's picking up like our with the pandemic our church has reached out significantly more than it had previously yep there's entire teams of people who will deliver groceries and have been since early march i know there are a few families that i don't think to this day have left their house since early march yeah which is sad in a lot of ways but you know with health concerns and stuff it's positive in a lot of ways but they're only able to do that when people from the outside are able to support them yep from the outside i need to be careful with how that comes out but you get my point people willing to sacrifice a little bit and and help other people out there's a lot more of that going on at least in my little pocket of the world so I, I, yep. I'm with you in that we tend to reach out. I know that at the same time, there are a lot of churches that we have some relationships with that are the opposite. They've turned internal and haven't reached out because they feel it's more of a risk. Mm -hmm. I can't argue with that. But at the same time, it to me, it doesn't fit the mission that we've been given. Now, again, I don't want to go too far down this spiritual what the bible says route here but interpretations are widely varying in this and yeah. I, again this is why this is kind of an odd time to read this book and it, it, it's hard to i feel like in the past we've tried to keep coronavirus conversations at a minimum on bookworm it's very hard to do that with this one <laughs> it is because so much of it is directly at, uh, against what we do with quarantine stuff in in place so what do you do with it so yes we tend to reach yeah. out again churches tend to make that a little bit easier in my opinion but not always well i will argue with uh, the churches that have gone inward for you i'll, <laughs> I'll put my own <laughs> foot in my own mouth sure go for it because i think this is the thing that really bugs me about a lot of the stuff that i see going on right now with with COVID is there are a couple different approaches that you can take. And when you think about the mission of the general church, again, from a Christian background, it is to help other people find the need, meet the need. You know, that is our professed belief. And that is something that we've been true to, even though COVID-19. Yep. I can see where if you're focused not on what sort of impact can you make, but how big can you grow, that this is a difficult time because people aren't coming. They're not giving their offerings, you know, and we're viewing it as like, well, I got to pay my bills and I got to make sure my needs are met. And I get that there's some very real stuff like staffs and things that need to be paid, but that's, 
that's not the way it was ever meant to be. And the moment that you start making it about you, you get a whole bunch of negative fruit that comes from that. And a lot of the stuff that you see in the news as it pertains to Christians is like the, the prototypical Florida man, you know, in the Home Depot throwing a fit because they're asking him to wear a mask. Yep. That guy is not a good representation of what it means to be a Christian because the church's goal is how can I help other people? And everything about these mask mandates, you know, I, I hate wearing a mask too, but if it's going to make people feel more comfortable or if it's going to decrease the chance that I could spread it to somebody else because I don't know if I have it, you know, if it's going to make somebody else feel better, basically, I'm going to do it. I don't go out all that often. It's not that hard for me to keep a mask in my car and throw it right. on when I'm at the store. Yep. And as a Christian, I absolutely should be doing that. It has nothing to do with my personal freedoms being under attack. It has everything to do with everybody else that I come in contact with. Yep. And 100%. Yeah. So I feel like uh, that stuff that you see, like that's kind of a residual effect of maybe some of these, um, some of these communities that have grown, gone a little too, uh, inward, you know, I think of like a, this is a graphic example, but you think of like an ingrown toenail, that thing is nasty. Oh, right? good. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that that's not normal. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And so, uh, I think a lot of this is solved with the application of the, the golden rule. And it kind of saddens me to see this extending into the church, but I totally get it. I mean, this is part of the society at large. Uh, this is really the root issue, I think, with a lot of the stuff that he's talking about in this whole first couple sections of this book in terms of like from the 1960s, the golden generation and where have we gone since then. It's all about me. It's all about instant gratification. They'd make a comment in the beginning about how it's a University of Chicago study. Let's see if I can find it real quick. It talks about the thing that's going to be most dangerous going forward. This is in 1958. The most dangerous threat over American society is the threat of leisure. We've gotten too comfortable. <laughs> We've gotten too used to our own needs being met at instantly. When we, whenever we want something, it's right there. The fact that we have to have some discipline and say no to ourselves so that other people can benefit, like that's a foreign topic for a lot of us. And it shouldn't be, yeah. especially for the church. Just as a to get off the church thing a little bit, a way that other people tend to build this community that has like a ritual based foundation of sorts, uh, as Otter points out in the chat, gyms and yeah. working out like CrossFit is the one that's, that's brought up here. And I, I have a friend who, well, he's with the church too, but he has a CrossFit gym that he, well, pre COVID was going to and had a group of people there that built up a lot, a strong, strong friendship around it. So that can be built in those ways as well. But again, that's ritual based. Church is ritual based. It's the similar, lots of arguments, lots of differences here, but there are similarities between those. So that's one side is like gyms and working out and athletics and such like teams. That's, that's a big way to do this as well. This is Partly why, if you follow the blog Art of Manliness, Brett McKay and team, they they tend to talk a lot about building strength and finding men to come around you. Again, this is from a male stance, but they talk about that quite a bit, and they talk a number of ways to do that. They've built their own little strenuous life team that you can join. There's ways that they encourage you and help you find people in your area to connect with, like, building community is a fairly big part of what they do do their shared suffering as otter says in the chat it's a great yeah. way to say it <laughs> it, it works out great uh in that sense so like that's one side of it uh the leisure thing i think is a fascinating point here because yes we have a lot of leisure but we love to fill it especially in today's culture we love to fill it with especially sports activities and such, which I think is why a lot of us have freaked out with quarantine and stay-at-home orders because now we're, like, being forced to actually 
have leisure instead of trying to fill it with a lot of space. The problem yeah. with that, I think, and I've talked about this in a lot of other scenarios, is that when you have time like that and you can sit and think, you tend to want to fight against something. Like we have a tendency to want to bond and collect together on a unified mission and fight against something. And right now we've turned that to pretty strongly in politics, pretty strongly with coronavirus. Like we we tend to want to join together and fight against something. Yeah. That's what we're doing. When you give us a ton of leisure, we're joining together and fighting against something. So you got you're you're now hunting for someone who disagrees with you because you want to join up and fight against something. Uh, when you don't have something like a world war or I don't even know what. If you don't have something like that to join the entire country together in a unified approach, you're going to pick sides and fight against something. It's an inborn, I don't want to say innate trait, but it kind of is. So Yeah. You're jumping way ahead. I am. But I actually had that down in an action item from section four. Sure. <laughs> Uh, section four, there's a chapter on the dark side of social capital, and they make the point exactly that you're talking about. Social capital is often most easily created in opposition to something. Yep. But that is not the best application of social capital. It's just the easiest. It's the path right. of least resistance. Yeah. So right, I, I agree. Ahead. I got excited. No, that's okay. I agree that that is kind of where you will naturally channel your social capital if you're not careful. But my action item is to take a stand for something, not against something. <laughs> I feel like that is the better approach. Uh, when you take a stand against something, you're kind of naturally bonding with people. But yep. when you take a stand for something, it's more naturally bridging, I feel. But anyways, that is a really... <laughs> A really loaded topic. Uh, I want to go back here, though, to chapter six and talk about informal social connections to make the difference here between machers. I don't know if I'm saying that right. They didn't give a pronunciation. Maybe. And schmoozers. That one I've heard before, so I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. Machers are people who make things happen in the community. They are people who are formally involved Schmoozers are people who spend many hours in communion and conversation and are usually informally involved. What's interesting about these to me is that there are also demographic information associated with each one of these. Uh, Machers tend to be better educated, ed educated and have higher incomes and they are disproportionately homeowners and long-term residents, whereas schmoozers are common at all levels in the social hierarchy and they are renters and frequent movers. And that is not to say that one of these is better than the other. But what he is saying in this book is that there is a decline in the machers and the schmoozers basically are remaining steady. So the average American is far more isolated, but they seem to be more engaged as friends than as citizens or as schmoozers instead of machers. Right. And I think when you trying to move on from the religion thing but what it does <laughs> is it strikes a perfect balance a lot of times between these two right it forces you to embrace both of them because i am a generally uh my approach to something if i'm going to be committed to something i'm going to be committed to it it's going to be formal i'm going to show up every two weeks and record a podcast about it <laughs> you know and there's going to be ramifications if people don't show up and it bugs me when people don't take things seriously right. like that. So I understand I am a prototypical matcher. And I know several people who are in my life who are schmoozers. And that again, that is not a bad thing. I think typically I've heard that word as a kind of negative, right. uh, negative label applied to somebody. It's not a bad thing. In fact, the schmoozing that I am forced to do, I know is good for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it grates against my personality. <laughs> it's difficult for me to do. Nice. Yeah, I I lead some volunteer teams. And as you're explaining this, it immediately came back to me. I know I've got a couple schmoozers on each of those teams. And in this particular case, that doesn't fit well. But we deal with it because volunteers. And... It takes a lot more work for me to collaborate with and engage with the schmoozers in this case 
than the Machers. So again, different cases I feel like have benefits and detriments for being either or both of these in some cases. So I, to your point, like it's not necessarily bad because in some cases, like, yeah, reaching out and asking for help and such, that's a good thing in a lot of ways. Like it, it's one thing that like our generation has a tendency to want to be very independent. We want to do things on our own like that. We don't want to be requiring support from somebody or something outside of us. We want everything to be our under our own control. And when I have to ask somebody for help, it forces me to admit a couple things. One, that I need help. And it also forces me to give the other person the opportunity to act on that. And it, it's always interesting to me. It's like, I don't want to reach out for help on things. My tendency is to want to be very independent. And yet, I absolutely love it when people ask me for help. Like that is a thing I absolutely love. Like there are some certain skills that I'm, I know I'm good at, especially in comparison to the general population. And I love it when people ask me for help with those things, but me asking them for help in something that they're a professional at and that they love to help other people with, like, I just don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I don't think. I look forward to people asking me for really? help. Yeah, because this isn't for everybody. Yeah. Like it's not 100%. I would prefer we all agree that we're going to be at a certain place at a certain time and do a thing together. Yeah. <laughs> then, hey, if you need help, let me know. <laughs> right, right. Where I am that way, if someone were to say, hey, can you come help me lay a floor in my kitchen? I'm there. I'm all over that. I love doing that sort of thing. If someone asks for help building a stream rig, I'm on. Like, let's go. And I will, if you want me to, I'll build the whole thing for you. Like, that's the way I operate. But I know there are people like, don't ask me for help. I know I'm good at this, but don't. I don't, I don't want to help you. I want to do my own thing. Yes, I get that. But I'm not that. <laughs> uh, I also think that the important takeaway from this section is that a community needs both of these. So maybe you identify as one or the other, or maybe you're a chameleon and you can go back and forth between them like Joe. I don't know. But uh, I think the important thing from this is to recognize that whether you are more naturally a macho or a schmoozer, you do have a role to play in building the social capital of the communities that you choose to be involved with doesn't mean everything is going to be the way you want it to be. That's the big takeaway for me over the last several years. Uh, being an elder at the church that we belong to, I have been forced outside of my comfort zone. I've talked before on Book Room, like one of the qualifications of elders, the biblical definition of elder is that you have to enjoy having people over to your home. And I was like, uh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> If I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not something that my natural personality, I'm more of an introvert. You know, introverts unite separately in your own homes. I have the t-shirt. <laughs> but I recognize that good happens from me putting myself out there. So it's not just like, oh, this is uncomfortable. I want this to stop. It's recognizing that it takes all types to really build a, an effective community. Yeah, the, the chat's having a conversation, which I think is important to bring up here. Is like if, if you want to be at, like if you like being asked for help, some people don't want to help because they don't feel like they're an expert or at something and don't necessarily feel like they know enough to be able to help other people. Yeah, that's true. And, and I get that. I mean, that's the imposter syndrome, right? That you feel like you're faking your way through things. Guess what? We all are. So... <laughs> Yep. At some point, you have to come to grips with that. I don't consider myself a tech support guru and genius and an expert at it. I don't really think of myself that way, but I know a lot more about it than most people. Mm -hmm. And having done it for long enough, like I know more than most people about that. Now, do other people know more than me? Absolutely. 100%. 
I am the first one that will tell you I don't know everything about it. And that's that's an important aspect of this is like you have to be okay saying, hey, I'll do my best, but if I can't come up with a solution, here are some other people or other ways that you can solve this. I'm not a hardware expert. I know software, but I'm not a hardware expert. I'm getting better. I've worked with enough hardware changes and swapping out hard drives and stuff that I know enough about it to, to be dangerous. But I also know that when it gets over my head, I know where to send people. That's, that's a big key differentiator there is like, I don't necessarily have the answer, but I know how you can get it. Sure. And that to, that to a lot of people is just as valuable as you actually doing the work. So imposter syndrome, it's complicated. <laughs> I think this is where some of the nuance comes in between bridging and bonding communities too, because if you're in a bonding community, the fact that you don't know something and you're hesitant to ask something, yeah, you could add kind of the worst case scenario that goes through somebody's head in those situations is, well, I don't want to look like an idiot. And then someone's going to get mad at me and kick me out of the forum. You know? Right. Right. And a bonding community. Absolutely. That is a possibility. But a bridging community is like, no, there's no titles here. Just ask your question. Like we're here to help each other out. And so maybe you can use that as a way to identify what type of community you're really involved yeah, with. Yeah, for too. sure. All right, let's move on to the next piece here. Section three is why. I don't have a ton that I wanna talk about in this section. There's several chapters talks about the pressures of time and money, mobility and sprawl, technology and mass media, generation to generation. And then there's one final chapter in here, chapter 15, what killed civic engagement, summing it all up. And the basic gist of this is that a big part of this is generational change. Some of it is work, specifically women who used to stay home now having careers outside of the home. Uh, he makes an interesting point there about the majority of the people that from the studies that they did anyways doing that out of necessity because they needed the money as opposed to this is something that i find personally fulfilling which i am 100 percent uh in support of someone who wants to not just stay at home and go have a career if they really want to have a career i do think it's sad if the primary breadwinner and again this could be male or female i know uh, relationships and where it's the opposite where the wife works and the, the, the man is the one who stays home with, with the kids. Uh, but the point being here that if that's what you want, then that is perfectly fine and that's great. But if you want to work outside the home, then that's fine and that's perfectly great as well. What is sad is when we extend our lifestyles to the point where we have to work outside the home, both of us in order to make ends meet. And it sounds like that is what uh, a lot of this is is coming from yeah it's With interesting the, the yeah it's the the ramifications of that real small decision right so if you yep. want to live in the big fancy house with 120 acres on it it's going to be expensive it's going to require a certain income to make that happen and if that income level is high enough that it requires a dual income to accomplish that's a lifestyle choice. You know, I've, I've yeah. had this conversation a lot recently with, you know, career conversations and house move conversations and stuff. We've been talking about this a lot. And every single one of those decisions is a lifestyle change. If I choose to work at a church and do side gigs, it's going to require a certain number of hours and commitment through my entire week on a week to week basis, as opposed to going to work at a tech company where you're making six figures once or twice over and you don't have to work the 40, 50, 60 hours, you're working 30, but the expectations of that 30 hours is significantly higher. The stress load might be higher depending on the company you join. Like there's so many choices that come with that. Those are lifestyle differences and in some cases, that 30 hours may sound like what I just explained. If you're making $200,000 and you're working 30 hours a week and you've got every Friday off, that sounds amazing. But if you're someone like me, my mind races and I'm busy enough that that's giving me a lot of leisure time. 
that is going to drive me up a wall. That's not necessarily <laughs> the right move for me. Like that's that's a difficult conversation to have. So it's not as simple as, oh, it's more money and less time. Great, go. It's not that simple. Yeah. It's a lifestyle change. And again, if your choice in income dictates high income, like if your lifestyle that you want dictates high income and long hours, it's going to force some of these decisions for you. You aren't necessarily going to be able to join the community groups and be a part of small groups and have people over. Like you may not be able to do that just because of time commitment involved. So yes, it dictates a lot of things. Yeah, and that's the point I think that they're trying to make here is kind of a lifestyle creep thing. We have more prosperity, more leisure than we have traditionally had. And so what do we do? We buy nicer stuff and then work longer hours to pay for it. <laughs> right, right. Which is not necessarily the correct answer. And everyone has to define their own correct answer for this. But again, from a large macro, uh, or is it micro? Large microeconomic perspective, uh, looking at society at large, I think there's a pretty compelling case to be made by the data they share in this book that a lot of people are making the wrong choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of a warning, like, hey, look out, because there will be a day of reckoning for all these things. All the choices that we've made, they have ramifications. And if we're not careful, we're not going to like some of the results that we get from some of these choices. And work is just one specific piece of this. He mentions uh, urban sprawl. He mentions generational change. He mentions TV specifically. And I think there's a point to be made here as it pertains to TV and generational change because there's overlap there. Uh, there's a pie chart at the end which kind of explains the percentage contribution that they estimate each one of these things has had. But the generation to generation chapter on page 272, he says, they watch television differently, more habitually, even mindlessly, and those different ways in which TV are used are linked to different levels of civic engagement. And that sounds very much like a lot of the stuff we've heard when it comes to social media and smartphone use, only exponentially greater uh, as you watch something like The Social Dilemma. By the way, I kind of wish that Tristan Harris had worked on this with Robert Putnam. With Putnam. I feel, yeah, I feel like that would have been a really cool afterward. <laughs> <laughs> that I feel like been fun. <laughs> they take pretty strong stances on the role of technology and stuff. And Robert right. Putnam kind of wants to hedge it a little bit yep. and say, well, I guess, you know, you could say technology is having this negative effect, but it's not all the technology's fault, you know, and I feel it's, it's safer to say it is the technology's fault where we are t today right. for a lot of this stuff. But it's interesting, even in 2000, when he's writing this, he's talking about the uh, the Gen Xers and how greed trumps community. Again, generalized statement. I get that, but they did the research. <laughs> so get mad at them, not me. <laughs> uh, but basically, like the baby boomers were the first generation which was exposed to TV their entire lives. And as they were exposed to it and their kids were exposed to it. You can kind of see the effect that this is having going forward and it's not necessarily great. Yesterday I, I ran sound for our church service and I had my oldest daughter with me, Emma, and we were walking to the car on our way home and Emma asked me, she, she sometimes asks really random questions not connected to anything going on which is not abnormal given me <laughs> I do the same thing so she she asked me he's like dad why is there a tv connection in the bathroom downstairs because in the bathroom actually it's right here there is a coax connection so you could plug your tv in to get internet and stuff to it so that that exists there and they're in a lot of different places in our house. Whoever wired this house chose to put those ports in every single room. And there are there there's evidence that they installed TVs in a lot of rooms as well. Now we've since removed a lot of that evidence, but there's 
definitely evidence of a TV that used to exist in this bathroom. And she was curious, like, why is that in there? <laughs> and I had to tell Good her, well, question, Emma. <laughs> some people put TVs in the bathroom. Like, you know, it's not uncommon in the United States for people to have TVs in almost every room in the house. I forget what the number is. Is like an average of three and a half to four TVs per household, or it's something ridiculous Bonkers. like that. Um, we have one, and it's kind of out of the well. It's right there behind me. It's out of the way. It's not, and it, it's very specific in when we'll turn it on. It's usually special occasions, Christmas being one of those, because we'll watch Christmas movies, and the. Every Sunday night, we have a, ru a ritual in our house of doing popcorn and cheese and veggies and stuff on a tray, and we go watch a TV show or a movie with the girls uh, on Sunday nights. That's really the only time it's on, so they don't really see it used ever. So the concept of a TV in a bathroom is just bonkers to them. They, like, they can't even, like, what? Her comment was, why would you be in the bathroom that long? Because in her mind... You're watching a movie when you sure. <laughs> when you have a TV. There is no other way of using a TV other than watching a movie in her mind. So <laughs> having a TV in a bathroom makes no sense. So I was trying to explain a few things like, okay, news. People turn the news on. People sometimes have a bunch of TVs showing the same thing so they can go around the house doing things and watch TV at the same time. Like I was trying to explain this and she's like, why don't we do any of that? Or no. That was later on. So at that moment, she's like, why would you want to watch TV that long? It's really bad for you to do that. It's like, she's seven. Yep. And she gets that. Now, granted, she's our child. So we talk about this stuff and how being on screens that long is not a good thing. So when he's talking about TVs and how that stuff changes what you're willing to do and it sucks up a lot of time. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's going to change your lifestyle if you're going to commit 40 hours a week to watching TV, which will, I think that's the number lately. 40 mm -hmm. hours a week is what people spend on TV. I, I can't even get my head around that. Like It's so hard for me to get to that point. Let's modernize this, though. Let's make this a 2020 version. Why <laughs> would you bring your phone into the bathroom? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> Yet that's what everybody does. Yep. <laughs> so true, so true. So it's only weird if you don't do it, <laughs> really. Absolutely, yeah. And I think the value here in terms of this technology section, and this is a broader topic than just bowling alone. He's making the case that this has impacted our social relationships, but you and I both know that this goes far beyond our relationships, that there's negative stuff that goes along with unintentional technology use. And the TV example, 40 hours a week, is kind of a dated example at this point a more relevant example would be the amount of time you spend on your device looking at your screen time getting those stats and saying did i really mean to be using my phone for eight hours a day because right, right. that's what people do and if you're not okay with that then figuring out what are some of the systems you're going to build which are going to help you fight back against that because that is the default and that's the thing that's worth calling out here, I think, is that all the stuff that he's talking about, this is the default. And you don't have to just live your life by default. You do have the ability to go against the grain, but it's not always easy. I think it requires a vision of what you want your life to look like. And part of that is the relationships that you have. And then figuring out what do I have to do design wise in order to create that life that I want to live. Right. I I just have I have to make this comment because the chat has an amazing comment. I wonder how That's many great. couples I wonder how many couples met online while in the bathroom and don't realize it. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> it is. All right. Section four. Yep. So what? Uh, and there's a couple things that I want to talk about here. The first part of this in the introduction section of this, or chapter in this section, chapter 16, he shares a map which shows the social capital in the different states 
in the U.S. Minnesota is very high in social capital. Yeah, it's towards the top, like yep. as far as the ranking there. Yep. Wisconsin's pretty high too, and the measures that they use for for this is like community organized life, engagement, public affairs, community volunteerism, informal sociability, and social trust. And uh, they make a connection here in the introduction of the overlay of this map now being relevant as it pertains to what we know historically about slavery in the South and a lack of civic engagement right now, which is really, really interesting, uh, especially if you extrapolate that forward and you ask yourself the question that this whole section is based off of. So what, like, what does this mean right now? What are the ramifications of low social capital in some of these Southern states now? And, uh, there's some interesting conclusions that could be drawn there. I'll just mention a couple of the sections here, uh, education and children's welfare, safe and productive neighborhoods, economic prosperity, health and happiness democracy and then chapter 22 this is the dark side of social capital we kind of talked a little bit about this right right already. i got excited yeah we can talk more about that if you want but i think i just want to kind of summarize the other stuff here i mean every single one of these different sections that he breaks down in uh, in these chapters shows that good stuff happens when you have social capital bad stuff happens <laughs> when you don't so the states that are high in social capital they keep bad things from happening to good kids is how he puts it in chapter 17. They watch less TV. They are higher educated. They've got a good home life. Their neighborhoods are safe and productive. Murder rates are much lower. Uh, so inversely, they're much higher in the areas that have low social capital. Um, they are uh, weak ties are likely to link us to unexpected opportunities. Uh, that's from chapter 19 on economic prosperity. So the more social capital you have, the more bridging you have in your communities, the more you might run into somebody at a dinner party, or even if you like met them online, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that I do now, I think is kind of the result of bridging through online communities. Right. right. Um, so there's a lot uh, there's a lot of stuff that's really relevant here health and happiness people who are socially disconnected are two to five times more likely to die from any disease i mean as we're talking about where we are right now and end of 2020 with covid i think that that's that's relevant but not just with covid obviously uh, democracy higher social capital means more people get out to vote democracy functions as it should you know uh, so lots of good stuff that happens from this and then kind of the the dark side of this, you know, the the negative way that this can be manifested, uh, like the the KKK, the gangs, stuff like that. Uh, that's chapter 22. There's a lot here. Uh, you're you're basically getting into. Who cares that it's going south as far as community engagement and social capital levels and. I think that map is interesting being from a state that is like at the top of that list of having very high social capital. I, I was, when I saw that, I was thinking about, okay, my community, then my County, my state, what is it that we know, or what is it that we do different? Because I also like my roots are from a state that's not very high. And I'm now in one that is very high. So it's it's interesting to me to try to compare those two. It's also interesting that coming from a state that's very high, like there's a thing, Minnesota nice. People know this. Like it's a common phrase. People all over the U.S. know this phrase. And it's so true. <laughs> like we don't want to offend other people because we're trying to be kind. It's very evident like you see it on the road you see it on especially in driving in so many different scenarios people are trying to be kind to each other not to say that everybody does because there are definitely people who try to take advantage of that but it is a very common thing that you see and hear so i don't know i don't i don't know what to say about it other than it's fascinating just to see it in real life and see what they have so like see that map in action yeah, uh, the thing 
I think is interesting about this is that the uh, the social capital. Uh, this is not again going back to the beginning and the reciprocity. So it's not assuming that I'm going to be doing this thing in order to get something back from other people, but ultimately that is what this manifests as. It's like, if you are focused on helping other people, then you will get back exponentially whatever you put out. Uh, and then this is breaking it down by geographic area. The, uh, the thing about the, the states that are high in this versus the states that are low in this, I kind of hesitate to, to really dig into this because I feel like there's some judgment he's making here about some of the, the yeah. southern states. But I also think it's a conversation that needs to be had right now, specifically politically. He talks about in the democracy section how if fewer voices participate, our politics will become more shrill and less balanced. Hmm, does that sound familiar? <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, and so I think part of this is looking at it historically through the lens of slavery, like he says in the introduction section, but also a part of this is like a warning for where things are at right now. I feel like you can look at this and you can say, we got to right this ship before it goes too far. Uh, and we just had, as we record this, a pretty contentious presidential election and Still do, probably. Yeah. Uh, I look at what... This is part of the reason I don't read the news anymore. <laughs> uh, I look at <laughs> Why? the Why? It's all positive, Mike. <laughs> I look at the, the fighting and the bickering that goes on from, uh, from both sides. Uh, I think in recent history, you can probably fault one side more than the other. <laughs> but uh, it is something that happens with with both sides and you can kind of trace that back to this this map um and i think the real trick here uh kind of the phrase i say over and over again to people who will listen whenever we talk about stuff like that is let's just be decent humans <laughs> <laughs> yeah why is this so hard <laughs> yep. uh and i think looking at this map it shows that the, my experiences and my communities, which are fairly high in social capital, maybe it is fairly easy to quote unquote, be a decent human. Uh, but that I can't assume that that's easy for everybody else. Uh, because according to this map, there are definitely areas where maybe this is a form of privilege, you know, that I have been in a position where I've had those conversations with people who disagree with me and I've learned to just listen to the other side without going hysterical, but it makes me sad every time I see that, that happening. So as a nation, you can look at this and be like, wow, I get why there's so much backbiting and infighting with stuff. And what can we do to, to build that social capital and, and bring this back because where we're headed is not a, a great it's it's not it doesn't paint a real rosy picture of a of a political future um i don't have any answers for that <laughs> other than to try and be more tolerant of voices that don't agree with me and that kind of gets into like the dark side of social capital one of the questions that they bring up there is the idea of social capital being at odds with liberty and liberty and tolerance and uh, he says that research shows there's a positive link between community and tolerance, actually, which maybe you would expect that not to be the case, because as we were recording this, we've been talking a lot about like the religious community. And that's the one that a lot of people I feel kind of real against as being intolerant. Uh, so I don't know, maybe tolerance doesn't exactly mean what we think it means. Maybe it doesn't mean that everything is going to go your way all the time. But I feel like this dialogue, that's the real idea to be unpacked here. And maybe not by us on this particular podcast, but this is the idea that really needs to be developed 
I think is the, the conversation needs to happen with people who disagree with each other. And yep. that's why if I'm thinking about the different types of social capital, if I were to pick one that's more important, it's bridging. Bonding is great, like it says, for, for just getting by. But I don't think there's a lot of people who are in survival mode at the moment who need that community to fight for them so that they can stay alive. Right, you know? right. I think the real valuable thing here is getting our eyes off of ourselves and our own problems and trying to understand the other side and their perspective on things. I think that that right there is the key. Like I was going to say, like you may not say you have answers, but I do. Like <laughs> this is this is something I've spent a lot of time with because coming from the church and with all the COVID regulations and things that come out, we have to navigate that and make blanket decisions. I don't want to make blanket decisions, but it's the exact same thing that the politics have, like the politicians have to do. They have to make blanket statements because they can't do all of the individuality that it requires in order to navigate all the individual pieces correctly. You have to do blanket statements for a couple reasons. Speed's sake, like you can't just go through and detail out all this stuff and people understand it. You have to do a blanket statement. And you also are then going to have to ignore some people as a result of that. I hate saying that, but you do. I make a lot of changes as an IT director that implement change to the people that I support. And guess what? They kick and scream when we do that. Of course it's going to happen. I jokingly tell my supervisor that I'm going to make a change. I will ignore all complaints for 30 days and listen to everyone after that point. The number of complaints I have 30 days after that point is almost zero every time. <laughs> so like that is just the way you have to operate at that level. Now, with all of this, like I was talking about earlier, like we have a tendency to want to fight. Like we have a tendency to want to join and fight. He talks about that here. And that side of it, I, I wish we could say we would join together and fight against coronavirus, but politics got involved. And when politics got involved, we were already polarized as Mosquito says in the chat, we were already polarized at that point. We were already differentiated red versus blue. That's the way we talk about it, red versus blue. We're not into this together. It's you versus us, and it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on because we made a fence, and we shouldn't yep. have. That's part of the core problem, and I, I have a tendency to want to have conversations with people who don't agree with me. Thankfully, I found a number of folks who have completely opposing views to me who are willing to engage in a debate and a conversation about That's it a trick. And, and be okay with not agreeing with each other. It is a trick. Like It's hard to find people right now who are willing to do that. It sounds like it's yeah. the same in the UK too. So like it's hard to do that. I wish there were more uh, people willing to do it, but it it's easier to sit back and say, these are my people. These are mm -hmm. the people on my side. And they keep telling me that mask wearing is a complete hoax and it does nothing. Yeah. Okay. But people on the other side can't understand why you wouldn't like you have competing information. And you know, if you want to see how the echo chamber happens in social media, go watch the social dilemma and it'll explain yeah. how the algorithm simply feeds you what you want to see. So you can't trust what social media is going to feed you. You're going to have to get off the digital stuff to do that. I'm ranting at this point. I'm going to quit, but that's, that's what I think. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Social media also feeds the taking a stance against something instead of taking a stance for something, I feel. Right, right. Um, and the other thing I want to respond to with what you said about the politicalization of wearing a mask, for example, because I've heard people say, oh, I wish it just wasn't so political. And my takeaway from reading this section is that everything is political and that should be fine. That shouldn't mean we can't have a conversation about it. <laughs> But it does. And that's why people make that statement is I wish this wasn't political right. because they view political as an us against them. There is no middle ground. I'm going to get my way or die trying sort of a thing. 
Right. And I think that's really sad. Yeah. I when feel... people refer to something being politicized, what what do you initially think of when they say something is politicized? You you think about two teams fighting yep. against each other. That that's yep. the initial thought that comes up into your mind whenever people say that. It which it shouldn't be that at all. No, it shouldn't. If you are taking this through the lens that I think he's trying to through bowling alone, we're all on the same team here as Americans. <laughs> yep. Ultimately, we want what's best for the the nation, we, for each other as a, a whole. And he makes the argument right at the beginning of this, you know, that if you do that, then ultimately that's going to get you further than trying to get your own way anyways, because with the help of other people through the whole idea of reciprocity, that's going to get you a lot further than you could ever get yourself. Right. So anyways, moving on from that, what is to be done? Section five. Uh, this is a short section. There's only a couple of chapters here. Less or Chapter 23 is Lessons of History, the Gilded Age, and the Progressive Era. The basic idea, if I were to distill this down into a very, very short version, because we are talking a lot, <laughs> <laughs> is that there have been several technological inventions that have made America in some ways less isolated, in some ways more isolated. The telegraph, the telephone, electricity, and the transcontinental railroad, he lists specifically. And the big point here, I think, is that we've changed our environment faster than we have changed ourselves. And so he makes this parallel that where we are now, as remember, he wrote this in year 2000. So uh, take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But he's talking about the time where we are now. It is very much like this Gilded Age and Progressive Era, where there's a lot of technological advance and unparalleled prosperity. There's a new concentration of wealth and corporate power, new forms of commerce, restructured work workplace, and the old strands of social connections were being destroyed. And that is totally where we're at now. You read Social Dilemma and you realize that, yeah, he really nailed, or you watch The Social Dilemma and you realize, yeah, he really nailed that point. Um, I wish, you know, he would have mentioned earlier, he would have taken a stronger, stronger stance about some of the internet related stuff. But the big question here in terms of like, well, what is to be done? Uh, he mentions what's going to be the 21st century version of the Boy Scouts that draws people back into community. He uses that. He lists a whole bunch of organizations, but that one right. specifically he calls out as like, this is an example of the type of organization that sprung up and built social capital. And what is going to be that now? It's not going to be Facebook. Yeah, I think there are, you know, kind of taking some of what he says and some of what I think here, what is to be done? What do you what do you do about this? And I think some of it is similar to what I've talked about with us in small groups at our church or the gym scenario or something along those lines, something that connects you with other people. I understand that's like impossible right now that it's very difficult to start building those relationships because I feel like the only way you can really do that at the level we're talking about is in person. Sure. It's a problem to, to say that that's what you need to do as soon as possible. That's like start making plans to be able to do something like that. Do zoom friend groups of sorts. I don't know what it is. Something. Do something. Yep. So that is like trying to build those is one side of it the things that we talked about is like how did we get to this point the why side of it like how are we getting to that point the high income lifestyle scenario changes the choice of screens and technology like those are probably the two biggest culprits here yes there are generational changes he goes through tons and tons and tons of stuff on generations and i i get that that's definitely a piece of it but i think those two aspects are ones that are easier for us to grasp and do something about so being willing to maybe say no to more screens you know go like us and just have a single tv in the house give your phones bedtimes like all the stuff we've heard about in the past like trying to limit screen times and stuff and focus more on in-person stuff again i know the caveats sorry but that stuff goes a long ways being empathetic trying to understand what other people are thinking and being willing to engage in cordial conversations about it all of these things can reverse a lot of the detriments that we've seen here granted some of this is reversing on its own 
I would mm-hmm. argue. But yes, do those things, please. <laughs> yeah, he mentions a couple specific strategies in chapter 24. Uh, he mentions, and it's interesting because I think COVID makes some of these more difficult, but also maybe makes some of them easier. Right. So participate in extracurricular activities. That one's kind of been blown up. <laughs> yep. Uh, make the workplace more family friendly. I would argue that one is a check in the positive box with a lot of people working from home. That maybe isn't positive initially because you got to figure some things out. But I think a lot of corporations are discovering that you don't need the commutes and to have everybody in the office all the time. You can have people work from home and they can be with their families more. And that's a good thing. Related, spend less time traveling and more time connecting. If you're not driving an hour each way into work every day, that's <laughs> that's easier. Uh, be more deeply engaged in faith-based communities. I mean, this is him talking, not me. <laughs> yep. All right. And be more tolerant of other communities. So those are both kind of like the same, same one. Right. Uh, and that is why being in being focused on just like your community as a, a church being a bonding community and going inward at this time, I feel like is such a negative thing uh, because this is really an opportunity for people to get plugged into the support system that they really right. need. And then the last one, use art to bring diverse groups of people together. The internet's actually really good for this. Uh, I think it's kind of cool to see people like I'm thinking of specifically Matt Ragland, who uh, used to work at ConvertKit, used to work at Podia. Podia. Yep. And now is doing his own thing. Okay. Sorry. I got a really loud noise coming in through my ceiling. <laughs> I'll go back nice. there. Uh, he's doing his, his own thing, doing his own YouTube channel, doing that full time. Christopher Lolly is another one that I'm thinking of recently who started doing YouTube full time. I feel like technology has given us a lot of opportunities for people who didn't have an in at a major production company to make a name for themselves and earn a living as a as a creator. Uh, I feel like this is kind of like the golden age for content creators. Right, and right. that word maybe is a little overused. Content creator maybe has some negative connotations with it, depending on your perspective. But basic idea being, if you want to make something and make a living off of selling it on the internet, then this is a great time to be alive. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, and it's blown up in recent months for sure. There's a yep. lot of people stepping into it just as a side thing, as an outlet. They've got time, they need something to do. Why not make something for the internet? So, yep. Thus, TikTok. That leads us into the uh, last section here, the afterword, which is kind of specifically talking about technology and COVID-19. The specific question they ask at the beginning here, has Facebook replaced bowling leagues? Uh, No, no, it has not. (laughs) It tries. It tries. And this is my big issue with this whole section of the book is they kind of hedge it as like, well, it could if you have the right kind. No. No, it cannot. It will not. <laughs> Facebook is evil. Stay off of it. I'll right. say that. You know, it, it bothers me that people try to straddle this fence so often. Just get off of Facebook. Your life will be better. Yes. I'm in the process of writing uh, the talks for a couple of classes at our church. I've been asked to do a little more speaking and of course it's a mess to figure out how to even do that in person and as part of that my expertise revolves around some of this area I guess in the computer side of it knowing that I'm speaking to people who have no clue like wait Facebook tracks me like that's the type of person we're talking about they have no concept that that is even a thing so I've given one talk on that already and people want a lot more of that. So I'm working on a talk around the science behind what happens when you're doing screen time versus things that are analog. Yeah, Obviously there's gonna end up being a plug for analog Joe in that, of course. Uh, (laughs) So that's one side of it. The other side of it is uh, the second talk I'm working on is like social media and relationships. And how does posting and 
communicating via social media work and not work. That's a lot of what that is about. This ties into that very closely, just because you know that all of the technology, the social networks, the social media, it's not a good way to communicate. And you know, the, the age old question at this point is, you know, who's ever changed their opinion on something based on a post somebody made on Facebook? I can't say I've ever had even a, an opinion maybe swayed a little bit, but definitely not flipped, especially yep. politically via social media. You know, there are a couple of folks I follow on Twitter that I am on the complete opposite end of the spectrum with politically. And the name calling and stuff, I just do not get. I, I've never yeah. understood how name calling is a positive thing via social media. Like, what is that supposed to do? How is this just you venting? Like, is venting is this for you, not me? Then why are you sharing it with me? Like, I, I've never understood that. That's and yet part people of do it, it all the time. That's part of it, I'm sure. He mentions that expressive activities abound on the internet, but not engaged activities. The other thing that kind of blew my mind here is that few Americans have separate online and offline lives. I put in parentheses in my mind node file, except for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Because he mentions <laughs> that most Facebook connections are within 50 miles of each other. And so for most people, the real and the virtual right. are blended. And I think that's where a lot of this issue comes from is the fact that it's an expressive activity to people that you typically know in real life but you're not really engaging with them in a dialogue. It's more of a, a monologue. And he does call out, so we do have to mention this, that the whole idea of like the political polarization, this did exist before social networks. Yes. So it, it is not completely Facebook's fault. Facebook definitely makes this worse. Helps it. <laughs> yes. Because these algorithms are silent nudgers and spreaders of disinformation. He mentions that basically the way that most people use social networks, they're high in bonding, but low in bridging social capital. I think that's a perfect encapsulation yeah. of what's really going on there. Sure. So yeah. the big thing from this afterwards section is that your Facebook friends, how many you have, has nothing to do with how happy you are. But the number of offline friends that you have has a big impact on how happy you are. So that's the one that we need to be focusing on. More screen time equals less happiness. The internet is kind of custom built for people who are lonely, which I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing, except when you combine it with all the other factors, you have people who are looking for something that they're not gonna get because of the nature of the thing and the algorithm feeding you things which are gonna just kind of exacerbate that and force you to stay connected to the, the feed. You know, it's, it's not a great scenario. Lots of thoughts. I feel like I should stop though. <laughs> At this point, right. I feel like I'm starting to reiterate myself. So, sure. I mean, long story short, you know, social media does create the echo chamber. Political polarization is a thing and it certainly can help with that. But if you ever want proof that it's not new, there's a couple YouTube videos. I'll have to see if I can find one of them that shows you the political election map going back to as early as they have the accurate data for it, I think. I don't remember if it was actually first election and such, but I, I know it goes way back. And you can see the extreme swings, Republican, Democrat, to like sweeping 95% of the electoral college and like both sides having that just within a few years of each other or a few elections of each other. So like, yeah, it can swing pretty significantly. People talk about how, you know, one party or the other is going in for a long haul and they're going to have the uh, the power for extended decades. Like, that's never happened. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't foresee that actually happening. If you're super scared about one party or the other having too much control, wait 4 years. <laughs> like it doesn't take long to yep, switch power from one side to the other. So personally, from a lot of this side of things, I don't put that much weight in politics, government and such. Like I have a tendency to put hope elsewhere. Just going to say that. Mm -hmm. So I don't put a lot of weight on it. It's not the end all be all health and politics. Like my life is outside of that. 
it, it doesn't have to have that much weight on it. And yet that is where a large percent of our population is putting their trust right now. It's like, don't threaten my health, don't threaten my politics, and the whole world is crumbling if you do either one. Yeah. Honestly, that's a sad existence in my opinion. It is. All right. So action items, do you have any from reading this book? No. That was pretty All definite, right. wasn't it? <laughs> no, it was. I don't. <laughs> I mentioned, yeah, it, it's an interesting read, but I don't have anything that I would act on because I feel like a lot of the stuff I would put, I'm already doing. Sure. Well, the one action item I wrote down is that I want to take a stand for something and not against something. I feel like there's a couple of places that could be expressed as one of my words for 2021 is community. So I found like bridging and bonding that concept specifically important as I think about how do I build different communities like the Bookworm Club, for example. And I don't have any clear path forward actions from thinking about that, but it's something that I wanna continue to ponder. Sure. So I'll write that one down as the official one and I think that's easy to do between now and two weeks from now when we record the next one. But I also think this is going to be one of those things that just kind of shifts my perspective and it changes a lot of stuff going forward. Kind of a tipping point in terms of community building for me. Sure. The chat gave me an action item. All Don't right. pick a long book again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't pick this one. It was I know me, I didn't. So. <laughs> All I'm right, definitely going to be looking at page count before I <laughs> choose them from now on. <laughs> All right. So that let's get into style and rating then. That's a perfect segue. <laughs> so my book, I go first. Yep. Uh, this is a boring read. I'll just say that right away. <laughs> it's not, the, their approach is not wrong. Uh, I don't think they could have written it in a different way. I think if you want to speak authoritatively on this topic, you kind of have to write it the way that they did. I think unless you are interested in understanding what is going on with social capital in the United States, though, you don't want to just pick this one up. Uh, I do think that there is a lot of value to be had from this one. I do think, especially after talking through this now, that this is going to be one of those books that I look back on and reference quite a bit, if nothing else, just for the bridging versus bonding piece at the beginning. But there's a lot of other stuff in here too that I, I feel has the potential to really stick with me and change how I approach things going forward. Really hard to rate this one because I have to rate it from this moment in time after being exhausted trying to get through it. So from a bookworm perspective, not a great book. I feel like from a grow your perspective, uh, make a collection of books that are influential in terms of how you view the world. This is absolutely one that like Jim Rohn would say you want in your collection. <sighs> what am I going to rate this at? <laughs> I think I'm going to rate it 3.5. And I would rate it higher. I would give it a four had they come out stronger against social media. And, and I get like that. Even me saying that is a little bit weird because they talk about taking a stand for something, not against something. And here but I really do feel that a combination of the social dilemma and what they wrote in the afterward is the appropriate perspective to provide given what we know now and where we are with social media and social networks specifically and just the fact that everybody has a smartphone i know it's a generalized statement but it is uh it's pretty true um and i feel like most people again a general statement but i think it's true don't ever think about how they interact with those technologies and the effect that that is having on their social capital the relationships that really are going to be important for them when stuff hits the fan. And I think it's a really important topic. I think it's really worth considering right now. Uh, they make a, a case in the political section about how like the real decisions that affect social capital aren't made in Washington. It's the local stuff. And so I think this is something that needs more attention. I think it's something that people need to pay more attention to, spend more time thinking about, 
in considering. And just that alone, I think would have a pretty positive effect, especially for some of these, like you go back to that map, some of the states that have very low social capital. I mean, if anybody starts thinking about this stuff, it's going to have a, a ripple effect. There's right. going to be a, a swell from that. So I think it's very timely. I think it's very appropriate. I think it's important as we think about transitioning out of COVID quarantines, like how do we re-engage with stuff? What's the right way to do things? What's the balance here? They talk about at the very end, virtual works, but not always, or <laughs> not for everything. You know, there's going to be some pressure to just, oh, well, virtual is working. Let's just keep doing it. No, it's not the same thing. You got to recognize that and you got to figure out what's the best application for all the this technology that we have at our disposal. And ultimately, the best application of it is, I would argue, building stronger relationships. People are the reason for productivity, going back to Chris Bailey. So very, very important topic. Um, I do think that uh, it's worth pushing through and, and reading this one. You don't have to read every single word. There's tons of charts in here tons of research that they did. One of the most interesting charts was the one where the states with lower social capital had a much higher rate of giving other drivers the finger. <laughs> Not sure if you remember that one. I do remember that. That was a good one. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. Uh, I am glad to have read this and I really enjoyed the conversation that we had about it. But I don't think this is something that I would just recommend to, to anybody. Maybe the bookworm audience is more uh, disproportionately the type of person that I would recommend this book to. I could see that being the case. If you listen to bookworm at all for understanding the concept of the book without having to read it yourself, don't buy this one. You'll regret it. <laughs> but I'm glad that, that we went went through it. And I think that he makes some very compelling arguments. I feel like they are very logically and rationally built so it's hard to argue against them very different than the type of book we typically read though uh, not something that i want to do all the time but i'm glad to have read it once sure <laughs> so 3.5 i uh i i will join you on the boring train it took a long time to get through this one uh as far as like every whenever i'd sit down to read i had to sit longer to read, which my ADD was not happy about. Uh, so I, I don't think this is one that's, this is not one you're going to sit down and just be engrossed in. Like this is a, to use that term again, slog, going to have to sit down and work at this one to get through. One of the things that just like some small things that bugged me, they didn't vary sentence length. Did you notice this? They would do lots of long sentences yep. repeatedly, which if you are a writer and you pay attention to that sort of thing you mix up sentence length and paragraph length and such so that it stays engaging otherwise if there's just long after a long after a long it it gets to where it's very difficult to to read they don't do any of that to help you with it so it makes it difficult to focus on it i found that they're very rep he's very repetitive with words too like the reciprocity was a word at the beginning there for a little while, it was like every other sentence. And it's okay to repeat words, but not that fast. And he's just over and over and over. I know he has some accolades of other books that he's written and seems to get a lot of feedback that's positive from it. But just from a, a, like critiquing editing and grammar, it's not great just from a how it's written stance. So I really struggled with with some of that. I put a whenever I put out the tweet saying that this was a monster and it was a slog to get through somebody replied and said, "Oh yeah, if you want more pseudoscience, here you go." It's like, "Oh, that's actually, you know, that's an interesting way to explain this book, pseudoscience, because there's a ton of science in it. But they're using that science to make a point, but there's not a study on the point itself." that civilization, how do, how do they, the collapse of the American community. There's not science that just says the community itself is collapsing. Like that's, that's a pseudo term and, and they're using a lot of science around it to define it and explain it, but it's not an actual thing in itself. So you can't just say, here's a study that proves what I'm saying. So I thought that was interesting, pseudoscience kind of coming around that. So I don't think this is a great book, honestly. 
I mean, it's it's interesting to have the conversation about it and to have the feedback around what is going on in our communities, what are some things that are happening to it. It's something I've talked about a lot in other scenarios and have had these conversations with other folks, but it's not one that I've seen like a dedicated book or a, a conversation about it straight up. So it's nice to have, have that. I think this is a book that's nice to have like in the bank to reference. This is not one I will tell you to pick up. <laughs> That's I fair. don't I don't think this is one that is going to be on a recommendations list for me for quite a while. So I have a lot of qualms with it. There are some positive pieces in it. Obviously, we've talked about some of those. He has some good points that come out of it. I'm going to put it at 2.5, though, just because I there, there are a lot of things from a just a flat-out book-making stance that's not great from that but the content and what he's getting at makes sense i really wanted it to be half that size but he yeah. likes writing they, they like he really wanted to expand on it and it this is one of those books that you know we've talked about this before it's this isn't a book that's designed to either motivate you or give you a system it's not a functional or motivational book this is a me meandering journey that you're going to go on that's that's what this book is like so yeah. it's, it, he wants to take you on a journey and there's not necessarily a set destination. He has some destinations he wants to take you on, but he wants to take you on this journey. And that's the intent there. We don't tend to like those books a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's true. Just something to be aware of with our ratings. Like that's just kind of what we do. So anyway, I'm going to put it at 2.5. All right. Yeah, this is a, uh... Regarding the style, just real quickly, you mentioned that uh, it kind of talks a lot about all the different possible arguments against his points. I feel like he kind of has to take that approach. Yeah. So I'm not sure from what he wanted to accomplish that it could have been shorter. Correct. But from what we wanted to get out of the book, it could have been shorter. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's like what I wanted from you and what yep. like he has the knowledge and it seems like he has the writing ability, just chose not to do those in the way that I feel like we would want from him. So. Yep, no, that's, that's fair. All right, so let's put Bowling Alone on the shelf. What is next? The next one up is Lead Yourself First, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. This is by Raymond Kethledge and Michael Irwin. And there's an accolade here from the Wall Street Journal. Lead Yourself First makes a compelling argument for the in integral, integral, for the integral relationship between solitude and leadership, which I think will be interesting because I know you have a thing about solitude with your retreats. Yeah. And we've talked a lot about leadership. I can't say I've run across a book or something that combines those two in a consolidated source. So I think this will be kind of a fun one to go through. All right. And your choice following that is, have you picked it yet? On the fence. Um, Ooh, so it's not picked yet. So Sapiens is still in the running. <laughs> I would be okay reading that one, <laughs> not after bowling alone. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's, I don't read eBooks. The one I really want to read is the Great Mental Models, Volume 1, General Thinking Concepts, but they don't have a physical version you can buy anymore. It's just an eBook. So I think I'll hold off on that one. Okay. See if we can get a physical copy of that in the recent future. Looking at the Bookworm Club and the other ones that have received votes that we haven't really looked at i think i'm going to select discipline equals freedom by jocko willink uh, we read we read extreme ownership and i know this is like the extension of that and i'm curious as to whether this ends up being more of the awesome Jocko that I loved in Extreme Ownership or if it's kind of like the one that they wrote just to make a bunch of money off their previous success. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually one or the other, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping for the former and not the latter here. Yep. 
Exactly. What is it? Discipline equals freedom? That's what it yep. is? Yep. That sounds interesting. Yes. Of course yes, the does. military guys will talk about discipline. <laughs> I think That's this is kind of an interesting, I mean, I'm always up to talk about habits, but beginning of 2021, beginning of the new year is yep. when everybody talks about New Year's resolutions, which are garbage and you shouldn't set goals because they're <laughs> dumb. Really what you want to focus on are your habits. So very appropriate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, I hope you're ready for 4 a.m. 4 a.m.? 4.30 a.m.? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> uh, got any gap books? After that? No. <laughs> <laughs> with with Christmas and bowling alone and hiring somebody, I'll be good to get this one done. <laughs> I do have one I'm going to hope to get through. I mentioned this previously, The Organized Writer by Anthony Johnston. Ooh, yeah. I've heard about this one. I pre-ordered this one a while back and it came a couple weeks ago. And uh, I'm anxious to dive into it. Just didn't have the margin to do so. I'm on sabbatical as we record this, so hopefully I can get this one in. I started the uh, Lead Yourself first. That one seems to be a fairly easy read, at That's least good. compared to Bowling Alone. <laughs> I have not started it yet, so I was hoping, hoping. Fun times. Cool, cool. Yeah, I don't have any gap books, so yes. Merry All right. Christmas. Well, thank you, everyone, for putting up with us for so long uh this is a this is a, a lengthy episode if you made it this far we appreciate your attention we especially appreciate our book run club premium members we mentioned this a couple times here today but the people who are willing to support the show giving us a couple bucks a month that really means a lot helps us keep the lights on uh and as i mentioned at the beginning we are trying to think of new ways to add more value for the people who want to support the show financially uh, thank you to everybody else who is just listening and, and downloading the episode. Thank you to the people who attend live and make our live recordings more fun. If you want to do that, you can uh, you can go to uh, twitch.tv slash bookworm.fm. If you want to sign up for the Bookworm Premium Club, you can go to club.bookworm.fm slash membership. Great fun. I also shortened it for the Twitch thing, bookworm.fm slash live. Makes it easy too. Awesome. So I like making things simple if we can. <laughs> so anyway, there's that. Makes it a little bit easier. We're grateful to everyone who has tuned in today and uh, has been able to join us live. And if you are reading along with us, pick up Lead Yourself First by Raymond Kethledge and we'll join you in a couple weeks. <laughs>